We're continuing in the series called Believe, and this morning we're talking about the church. And so, uh, as with each week, there is a key question, a key verse, and a key idea. The key question is, how will God accomplish His plan? Since we're talking about the church, obviously, the answer is the church, that God's means or way in which He's accomplishing His plan is during this present age through His body, His community, the church. The key verse is in Ephesians 4.15. It says, speak the truth in love. We will grow to become, in every respect, a mature body of him. So the church is the body of Christ. Christ is the head, all right? And we are his body. We are his hands and feet here on earth in order to accomplish his plan. And the key idea, theological idea, that we derive from uh, the doctrine of the church that we find in the New Testament is that I believe the church is God's primary way to accomplish his purposes on earth. Would you repeat that with me? I believe the church is God's primary way to accomplish his purposes on earth. Last weekend, I wasn't here. I was actually in Arkansas. I was riding a bicycle every Columbus day. Some friends of mine, we go and we ride bikes. And so I was riding a mountain bike with some guys and we went across the Washita Mountains on the Womble Trail. And it was about uh, 15 miles out and then 15 miles back. And at the halfway point, there's this beautiful lake. So me and three buddies, uh, one who's not a believer, another who is a believer and has kind of had a roller coaster uh, walk with the Lord. Uh, The third guy is a former pastor who now uh, works um, here in our city as a CEO of a company in the city. But he kind of got burnt out on the church and kind of really just said, I'm I'm done with this for a while. And um, so he does church at home and he's just going through a season, but he's still my buddy and we hang out together and we, we have dialogue about this. So we get to the halfway point and it's a beautiful day in Arkansas. I mean, we're in the Washita Mountains. The, the foliage is turning. I mean, like they have a fall. It's crazy. Um, and uh, we've been riding bikes and the sun's high in the sky and it's a clear day and we're laying on the side of the bank of this lake and we're all just kind of laying there just enjoying this. And my friend who's the former pastor who's kind of jaded with the institutional church. He's like, man, this church service today is awesome. And I didn't say anything. And where two or more gathered um, in his name, there he is also in presence of the Lord. The body of Christ is comprised of those who've confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and who the Holy Spirit uh, dwells. And so um, I wasn't going to pick a little doctrinal argument with him but what happened at that moment was it revealed his idea that the church is universal and that is absolutely true but the church also gathers locally and has a very specific purpose and mission and these are cosmological supernatural realities as well as very concrete tangible realities that sometimes are hard to grasp okay And so whatever your feelings are about that or wherever you are in that, I'm going to try to walk through who the church is, what the church is about, and why the church exists, okay? And so let's walk through that today. Would you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we praise you that you love us, that you, in fact, are love. And you love us so much. You sent your son Jesus to die for us. And you've called us out of darkness to be your people, to be your priesthood, to be a nation, to be a household. And Lord God, that you dwell inside of us and that we can be brothers and sisters in Christ and have a purpose for our life because of you. Help us, Lord, to awaken to that fact. More than any other reality in our life that we would claim to be citizens of the kingdom of heaven and children of the most high God with a purpose and a plan for our life that is undeniable. So Lord... Awaken that in our hearts today. For anyone here who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that they wouldn't walk out of here today without giving their life to you, receiving your spirit. For those that have done that and yet are going through a difficult season or jaded or cynical or um, struggling, I pray, Lord God, that you would reawaken their hearts to you. You would give them a sense of purpose, that they would be committed to you, to your people, to your body, to your household, to your nation. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the first thing is, what is the church? And as we go to 2 Peter, I mean, 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter writes here in verse 9, 
You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. What nation do you belong to? How many of you, how many of you think you belong to a different nation? If I were to ask you, what, what's your nationality? Yeah. I already gave you the answer, right? <laughs> but the, the reality is, we are so divided in our country as Christians because primarily we identify ourselves as American. United States of America, I'm a U.S. citizen. I have rights. That's my nationality. We're divided along political lines. Our nation exists. Our, na- our founding fathers, they believe this, this, and this. And these people are, are, are you know, tre- treating our country and the founding of our country a travesty. And so we divide over it. We divide as Christians with one another over ideological and political boundaries when, in fact, if we identified ourselves as his chosen people, his royal priesthood, his holy nation... Our divisions would fade and you and I as brothers and sisters in Christ and what Jesus stands for, what the Bible teaches, we would be unified, not along uh, political party lines, not along ideological nationhood lines, but along kingdom nation lines. We are God's special possession that may declare his praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. And once you were not a people, But now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. What is the church? The church, uh, in this passage of scripture, there's a Greek word. um, And in in Danish uh, uh, language, it was uh, translated kirk. Anybody here named Kirk? No Kirks? Anybody know a Kirk? Okay, Kirk means church. All right? What it means is belonging to the Lord. Belonging to the Lord. Church means the people that belong to the Lord. The other word that is often translated uh, for the idea or meaning or understanding of church is ek kaleo, called out ones. All right? Um, In Ephesians 2.19, it says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, you are a whole building that is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by his spirit. So look at the number of metaphors, people, priesthood, nation, possession, citizens, household, building, temple. All of these are metaphors that comprise the idea of church. People belonging to the Lord who were called out of darkness. Now in in Roman culture, the assembly, the ek kaleho, the called out ones, are our citizens, Okay, and so uh, the Roman soldier would ride in on his horse and he'd unroll the scroll and he'd say, hear ye, hear ye, all citizens, ek kaleo, ek kaleo. And every citizen of Rome would come out of their home, the assemble, and they would assemble together, all right? And he would read the proclamation of the Caesar, the proclamation, all citizens. That was called the, the, the assembly. And so there's two ideas here, that you, God's chosen people, All right, his household, belonging to him, you belong to him, are now called out into this assembly, the gathering, to hear the word, to hear the message of the Lord. In the early New Testament, even before uh, the establishment of the church, John the Baptist and even Jesus himself were baptized. And baptism was, um, it was the tattooing of the day. Okay? I'm not going to ask how many have a tattoo, okay? It's astounding. All right? Um, Anyway, I'm not going to go down that rabbit thought. Stop, stop. Okay. Uh, Rabbit trail. Okay, so it was the tattooing of the day. It was the common way that you identified yourself with a group or uh, with a movement. 
It was an outward way in which you symbolized what you stood for. So, in the New Testament time, first, John baptized for the baptism of repentance. All right? In the New Testament time, baptism was the way in which you said, I am a member of the household of God. I am a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. It was an outward way that you said, inwardly, I have given my life to Jesus and I have received his Holy Spirit. And I want the world to know, and so I'm going to be tattooed, I'm going to be baptized outwardly so that you know what has transpired inwardly. And so this was a way in which you said, this is my passport, my citizenship. This is a way in which you said, this is my surname, my family. This is a way in which you said, this is the group or body of, what, of the people that I belong to. Okay? All right. So what is the church? The church is comprised of those who belong to the Lord, those who've been called out of darkness into relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. All right. Second thing, where is the church? Think about that. Anybody, anywhere on this planet as well as um, in heaven who is called upon the name of the Lord and receive the Holy Spirit of God, are members of the church. Right? Okay. That is referred to as the supernatural or universal church. So the first thing you need to understand is the Chalcedon Confession is where this was made true. And the Chalcedon Confession is this. There is one holy Catholic church that comes from Ephesians 4, where it says, keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one body. There's one spirit. There's one Lord, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, all right? To each one of us, a grace has been given as Christ has proportionate, Christ who is the head of the church. So many people confuse that Chalcedon Creed when it says one holy Catholic church. Catholic simply means universal, all right? So if I were to say, there's one universal church, everyone would go, got it. But as soon as I say the word Catholic, people are like. See, when the Chalcedon Confession was created, Catholicism wasn't a denomination. There weren't Baptists and Methodists and Lutherans and Episcopalians and Catholics. All right? Matter of fact, the fact that we have all those labels breaks down what the Chalcedon was trying to say, which is there is one universal, one universal church, and it is comprised of everyone who confesses Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and receives his Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit is the mark, the guarantee that you belong to the church, all right? The outward way in which you manifest that baptism of the Holy Spirit is through a physical baptism of saying, yes, I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior, and I want to tell the world. I want to be tattooed. I want everyone to know this is my citizenship. This is my household. This is the body to which I belong, okay? Now, while that is true, and I say this all the time, you don't go to church. You are the church wherever you go. While that is fundamentally true, The church, however, is manifested locally, all right? So Paul, in Acts chapter 20, he sends from Miletus, he sends for the elders of the church at Ephesus. He sends for a specific group of people from a specific church in a specific location, all right? He doesn't just say, calling all elders universally, all right? He doesn't do that. He says, send for me the Ephesian elders. In Revelation chapter one and two, it talks about uh, the seven churches, all right? And it even speaks in, 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 in Revelation two, verse one, to the angel of the church in Ephesus. All I'm saying is it's a, it's a very easy way to recognize that he's speaking about a particular church in a particular locale. All right, so the church is universal, right? but it manifests itself locally. The church is supernatural, and yet it's also very tangible and concrete. Here's an example. How many of you have a bank account? 
Come on. All right, thank you. How many of you believe that your money is at that bank? You're so disappointing. (laughs) Going to be disappointed. The reality is we know that conceptually, I go to the bank to get my money. But my money's not there. There's money there, but it's not my money. I mean, it's just money. Now, if there was a run on the banks, something economic crisis took place, an economic meltdown, and we all went to the bank to get what? Our money. Even though we know, conceptually, our money is not in the bank, if there was an economic meltdown, we want our money, right? So we all go to the bank, and the bank does what? It cannot give us all our money because our money isn't there. So while we're very comfortable in church life thinking, hey man, I'm a member of the church universal. And I go to church at the lake some days and you know, the hunting blind is my church. That's where I'm closest to Jesus, right there. And I got that, I got that big old book in my eyes. Praise the Lord. <laughs> All right, so we're, we're, we're very comfortable. <laughs> Sorry, fellas, I know it's the wrong season for that analogy. Um, but we're very comfortable with this theoretical supernatural church that we're a part of. The reality is when there's a crisis, when there's a global meltdown in our lives, we go and we run to the bank while we can, we can conceptually understand that our money's not there really, when, when life hits the fan, that supernatural ethereal church doesn't cut it. That church at the lake or the deer blind doesn't cut it. The reality is when life hits the fan, we want something tangible. We want something concrete, don't we? So we've, we live in an era, in the last 20 years, the church, the local church has taken a beating because we're all very comfortable with virtual now. I go to church online, wonderful. I can actually chat with my friends online. Okay, that's pretty good. It's easier for me to be authentic online. Okay. I would venture to say at some point in your life, there's going to be a breakdown and you're going to want to go down to that bank and you want to touch that cash tangibly. The body of Christ manifests itself locally. And that's why we are to be a part of a body. That's why we are to be a part of a household. That's why we are to be a part of a cell within the universal body. That church also has offices, ordinances, and order. There's elders and there's deacons. In the virtual church, I don't know who your virtual pastor is or your virtual elder is or your virtual deacons are, but they meet certain criteria laid out according to Scripture. The ordinances of the the church are baptism and the Lord's Supper. The order of the church, the church is to be done in an orderly way. Church discipline takes place. The church has a way in which it goes about and constructs itself according to God. Third thing, why is the church? In Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and prayer. So first of all, they gathered and they devoted themselves to learning and understanding the truth of teaching. They fellowshiped together. They broke bread and they prayed together. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders of the sign performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give anyone that had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts and they broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all people. And they added to the number daily of those who were being saved. One of the things I know when I read scripture is what the church does is vitally important. It teaches the truth about who God is. 
It exercises the ordinances, the Lord's Supper and baptism, breaking the bread together, the communion, and breaking of the bread of fellowship as well. Okay, so fellowship and communion. They worship together, they serve together, and they minister together. They take all their possessions, and anyone who has needs, they share everything in common. And they proclaim the gospel message of Jesus Christ. That's what the church does. And I don't care whether you're meeting in a home church. I don't care whether it's a church plant that meets in a strip center. I don't care whether it's a mega church or a TV televised church. The church has some common things. It proclaims the gospel message of Jesus Christ. It teaches and disciples. It fellowships. It shares its needs with one another as anyone has needs. Brothers and sisters, family members meeting the needs of others. And I know it's easy to get cynical. and It's easy to get jaded. But the reality is when you and I know one another and we care for one another like family, well, I don't know. Some of you guys have bad image of family. So when we care for one another better than family, when you know somebody next to you and you don't just come and sit next to that stranger and then go and leave and they're going through a hard time, what the church does is it, it gives, it ministers, it serves, it takes from what it has and it gives to the other person. And I know it's easy to be cynical and jaded. We talk about selling our possessions and giving of our stuff to other people and, and we go, well, yeah, well, that's just, you know, Pastor Jeff's going to just add to his, his uh, the, the money plate. He gets his percentage, and that's right. I'm going to go out and start driving that 11-year-old minivan that I'm in. <laughs> I, know there's, I know there's corruption out there, but seriously, guys, I've been in this thing for 20 years. And all my friends from seminary and every pastor I know is not part of that 2 or 3% of crooked cheats that they're going to get there. Scripture says it is better to tie a millstone, a giant boulder around your neck than to lead the little children of God astray. And those people, though they be few, they're the ones that make the TV newscast on KSAT or CNN or wherever else. But the other 98% of the guys I know that are busting their tails that are living belief, their means that are hand scraping, hand to mouth, trying to make it enough and they're not complaining about it because they're just glad that God called them. Those are the guys that I know. And that's, that's not the ones that we get jaded about. And yet we create a justification in our hearts and minds over the 2% rather than the 98 that are authentically serving and are legit ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't be cynical over the, over the 2%. Be grateful to God over the 98 that serve faithfully. Don't use it as an excuse so that you can sit on the sidelines and so that you can keep your possessions to yourself so that you can guard your heart against relationships with a brother and sister so that you can just come, eat, and leave. Be the body of Christ. Realize that you don't belong as a citizen to the United States of America. And if that offends you, I don't mean to be unpatriotic. We're blessed to be born where we're blessed, yippee. But there are brothers and sisters in Christ in China. There are brothers and sisters in Christ in Pakistan and Afghanistan. There are brothers and sisters in Christ in Iraq and Iran and in Turkey and all over this world that are more brothers and sisters in Christ than the stranger down the street who doesn't profess Jesus as his Lord and Savior. I don't know what I did. Thanks. They're more brothers and sisters in Christ than the stranger down the street who doesn't know Jesus as his Lord and Savior and doesn't care to. And they can wear red, white, and blue, but they are less your brother than the follower of Christ in Pakistan. And until we get that right in our heads and quit focusing on the things that divide us rather than the one thing that unifies us, and that is we are chosen people of God. We belong to him. Some of us divide over Longhorn versus Aggie versus Bear versus, well, it's stupid what we divide over. God's called us to be unified, and the way that we do that is in a locale. It is universally true that we who accept Jesus Christ and are filled with his Holy Spirit are his children, but it manifests itself fundamentally and concretely in the body of Christ, and I've been hurt by the church. I've been jaded and walked away. The last thing in the world I ever wanted to do was be a pastor of the church. And I've hated it. And I've hated its people. 
and I was wrong because I didn't have a full understanding that just because the church doesn't function as she should doesn't mean she's not the bride of Christ. And so rather than run away, we just need a higher bar to really be who God's called us to be. Because I know that when we live like that, it pleases God and it changes the world. Here's what scripture says. In Ephesians 3.10 it says, that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God is being made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That when we live as unified people, when we live out the gospel, when we love each other well and we break food in our homes together and we care for one another's needs and we proclaim the gospel and people are being added to our numbers daily, when, when that happens, the manifold wisdom of God is not just revealed on earth, it is revealed in heaven. The supernatural reality of who the body of Christ is, something bigger than us takes place. Our mission is bigger than our discomfort. In John 17, Jesus' prayer is, Lord God, make them one. Make the body one so that the world will know that you sent me. When you and I are unified, it proclaims that Jesus Christ is Lord. Psalm 133, one through three says this. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down the beard of Aaron's beard, down the collar of his robe, like the dew of Hermon falling from Mount Zion. Now here's the kicker. For there, where there's unity, for there the Lord bestows his blessing. Where there's unity, God bestows his blessing. And when we stop focusing on the things that divide us, whether Episcopalian, Catholic, Lutheran, Presbyterian, whether doctrinally this or doctrinally that, whether Aggie or Longhorn, whether Cowboy or Redskin, whatever, whether slave or free, Jew or Gentile, man, woman, whether it's our culture, our ethnicity, our color, when we get rid of all those things that divide us and say, you're my brother, you're my sister because Jesus died for us both and that is more important than anything. It's more important than my passport. It's more important than my voter registration. It's more important than the team I cheer for on the weekend. It is more important than anything else. When we get to that point, the world begins to see our unity and God's blessing God's blessing is bestowed in unity. This morning, we've had a number of people baptized in the first service because we simply said this. The universal church manifests itself locally. The outward display, the outward display of I belong to the body of Christ is the tattoo, I, I have a, my wedding ring is tattooed, all right? It's an outward sign that um, I, got, I got a woman and she's mine and I'm hers. And it ain't up for discussion. Because my ring falls off, I got a tattooed, brother. <laughs> all right? It's an outward display to the world of a com commitment that I've made. Baptism is that outward commitment that outward display of I belong to Jesus. And some of you have never been baptized because, you know, it just wasn't convenient or well, you weren't comfortable, you weren't good enough. <laughs> None of us. It's by God's grace. You're never gonna get to that place where you feel like you're good enough to be baptized. And once you do, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. The motivation is to say I belong to Jesus and it's his, it's his grace that has saved me. Some of you were baptized as infants and you've never had the opportunity to stand up and say, you know what, I belong to Jesus. Someone made that decision for you. You didn't make that decision for yourself. And so what all we do is just give people the opportunity to say, I want to be united with a local body of believers. I want the world to know that I belong to Jesus. If you're here today and you've never given your heart and life to Christ, you can do that today. You can say, I want to know Jesus and I want to belong to him. If you've already done that but you've never been baptized, how many of you have never been baptized? Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. All right, 
We were all there at one point, all right? And there are all kinds of reasons and excuses. We've done our job the best we know how to remove any of those. There's towels, there's shorts, there's t-shirts, swimsuits, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And this is one of the most unifying things when the people of God stand up and say, I belong to God. This is my family reunion. I belong to this family. This is my house. This is my citizenship. This is my nation. And the other people of God go, woohoo! And we celebrate the fact that we are one because where there's unity, God bestows his blessing. So the band's gonna come and they're gonna play a song. And like the four or five people that were baptized in the ser- first service, if you wanna be baptized and say, you know what, I gotta get this done. I'm gonna put this behind me. It's time. Just during the course of the song, walk over to this door right over here. This beautiful lady, Cindy, standing by the double doors. Just go over there. And there are people out back here that will welcome you, help you get situated, and then you'll come up, we'll baptize you, and we're going to have a a great family reunion, a great national pride day where we celebrate who we are as the citizenship of the kingdom and the king of heaven because that's who we are and that's who we belong to and that's our country and that's our destination. That's where we're from and where we're going. All right, so you guys stand together. If you're here today and you've never been baptized, I don't know how to make it any easier for you. Today's the day, okay? I'll see you over there.